Singapore generated about 6.94 million tons of solid waste last year, according to the National Environment Agency. And just about more than half of this was recycled. The recycling waste for plastic, uh, the sorry, recycling rate for plastic was 6% last year. So, Jeffrey, if I can ask you, how big is Singapore's waste problem at this point, and what is the government doing about moving from a linear to a circular economy? Yeah, thanks, Ishika, for the question. Um, well, I, I think as a small, low-lying country, definitely circularity and closing the waste loop is, is a key strategic priority for Singapore. Uh, and the government has been looking at circularity, the green economy, for some time. Uh, I think, in fact, um, the water story is a good example, right? Mm -hmm. I think our public utilities board has done a great job in closing the water loop by looking at new technologies like new water desalination. Mm -hmm. um, and, but beyond water, I think there are new constraints. Um, and plastic waste, e-waste, I think these are the new challenges that we need to deal with. Um, but, and, and the Singapore government has put in place um, certain plans and strategies to deal with this. I think a, a good milestone in our circular economy journey is the launch of the Zero Waste Master Plan mm -hmm. um, back in 2019. Uh, and essentially that, that plan looks at and identifies key waste streams, um, food waste, plastic waste, e-waste, as you mentioned, um, and really how do we tackle these waste streams and how do we reduce the waste that goes to our landfills. Um, so that's the Zero Waste Master Plan, and I think more recently, um, the, last year, the government announced the Singapore Green Plan. Mm -hmm. And as part of that plan, which basically is a whole of government uh, plan towards sustainable development, um, there are strategies and pillars that look at circularity. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with our waste streams? How do we promote sustainable living through recycling and better managing our waste resources? Joyce, if I could bring you in at this point, you've helped launch quite a few accelerators um, around sustainability, smart cities across Southeast Asia. Can you tell us about Hyperscale and Startup X and what yeah. work you're doing in that space? Yeah, so Startup X, we are an innovation company and we work with partners, we work with government agencies um, and corporates uh, to basically drive innovation with startups. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what we do then is launching accelerators across uh, different verticals. Um, and one of the very big areas then is in sustainability. So we are working with Jeffrey's team to look at uh, waste management, and we are working with startups from all around the globe um, that are tackling plastic waste and e-waste, um, both upstream and downstream across the entire waste value chain. We want to be able to actually work with them um, and get them to work with our partners um, to drive more innovation in the waste sector. What kinds of solutions have you come across at this point in the waste tech space? Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Um, so if you look at across the entire waste value chain, um, the waste sector is one where it requires sometimes quite deep-seated expertise. Yeah. And it's hard for you know, any young um, startup founder to come in and say, I want to build you know, great things in the waste sector mm -hmm. because they might lack the domain expertise to actually do more things in this space. Um, so a lot of them, um, a lot of the startups that we work with, they concentrate upstream which is looking at product redesign, alternative packaging, sustainable packaging, and so on. But we also do come across quite a number of um, um, maybe founders that are a little bit more mature, that have a number of years in the waste sector, um, and they are able to see what are the pain points in these sectors, and they want to tackle that. So you do see companies that are tackling much further downstream, um, that are looking at basically waste uh, treatment, waste sorting, automated sorting, and so on, okay. um, that are actually interested to you know, work with the waste managers, incumbent waste managers, to uh, collaborate um, and do more in this space. I guess, oh, would you like to ask? No, uh, I was just, I was just <laughs> yeah. jumping quickly, and I, I think beyond what um, Joyce mentioned, I think definitely we see a shift towards just demand for simple waste management solutions, right? Mm -hmm. Towards really circular solutions. Okay. And I think um, what's, what's quite in demand, especially in our region, is towards uh, areas like circ resource circularity. Uh, how do we close the waste loop? How do we uh, create more resilient resources? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we see uh, technologies and companies within some of these technologies. Yeah. So I suppose as a government, uh, you're going to have to deal with a lot of competing interests, especially as ESG becomes a bigger part of many discussions that you're having. How much is the government really willing to, <laughs> you know, allocate to the circular economy right now? Wow, okay, well, I can't, <laughs> I can't put a, 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 a specific number, but if I just reference um, Singapore government's research, innovation, and enterprise 
um, uh, strategy and, and budget, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, almost, I think, um, 400 million has been uh, allocated towards decarbonisation mm -hmm. uh, and circularity. Uh, and uh, there is an 80 million sort of funding for a close the loop sort of initiative as well. So I think there's, there's adequate monies that are being channeled towards okay. uh, this area. Yeah. I mean, we're in really very early stages right now when it comes to transitioning to a circular economy. As a startup, practically, what can, uh, as a startup founder, what can I do in terms of working with the government uh, in Singapore or working with big businesses here in the country um, to help them make that transition? You can go yeah. first. Well, I, I think um, the role of partnerships is definitely critical in this transition towards a circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the partnerships can come in the form of public-private partnerships as well as collaborations between large corporates, MNCs, and, and small companies, yeah. SMEs, and startups. And, and I think the government plays a role not just in funding, mm -hmm. right, but also in creating these platforms. Uh, as an example, uh, Enterprise Singapore, we have launched a series of sustainability open innovation challenges that really works with and identifies corporates, um, get them to identify their challenge statements, okay. um, and work with startups to, to sort of co-create and innovate uh, circular solutions. And, and, and in, this, in these platforms, I think that's where the startups can leverage the resources of the MNCs and the corporates, mm -hmm. um, whether it's in funding, uh, mentorship, test bidding uh, facilities, yeah. um, as, as an example. Yeah. yeah. So if I, um, so, so we are part of an alliance called the Sustainability and Innovation Alliance. Okay. Um, the alliance has just celebrated its first year anniversary. Um, and at the core of the alliance, um, and there's about 700 plus members and advocates from all around the world that's a part of this alliance. Um, and, and at the very core of it is the idea that collaboration is the way to go for sustainable innovation. It doesn't matter whether you are a startup founder or an investor or corporate innovator or regulator. Um, the, the core of it is not about disrupting. It's actually about collaborating together so that we can drive more sustainable innovation. And I think, you know, whether you are an academic um, that's trying to do, that's trying to create research in this space, or you're a startup founder that's trying to build more sustainable solutions, you have to learn to figure out how to actually work with the regulators better. You have to learn how to work with the corporates better. And we need to establish what is that easier framework for um, people to collab collaborate better so that they can bring together more sustainable practices. Mm. Um, and that's what we try to do. Um, through the accelerator then, the idea is that at the end of the day, we want to be able to you know, connect um, the startup founders um, and the solutions that they have together with the, the waste, incumbent, uh, waste management incumbents so that they can actually collaborate and they can actually pilot their solutions together in the industry. And the way that we want to do it is to facilitate an, an easier way and an easier approach to do that. So I think the bottom line is, is understanding it from a collaboration perspective um, and then things can flow better. Which sectors are sort of facing the most pressure right now in terms of making that transition? In Singapore or in South The, the corporates are facing <laughs> a lot of the pressure. Yeah, um, which industries? Which industries? Yeah. I do think overall there are... Well, if you, if you look at it from, let's say, the consumer's consciousness about things, um, more and more consumers are demanding that um, the brands that they purchase from, um, they have to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and, and uh, at the same time, then there are also the regulators, and maybe Jeffrey is the best place to answer this. There are also the regulators who are saying, hey, you know, there are certain areas. For example, if you are a, um, a, an e-waste producer, mm -hmm. you have to be a lot more um, uptight about, you know, how um, you are generating all of these ways and what you're doing about it, um, and so on and so forth. And then at the same time, they are also facing, you know, pressure from their shareholders um, who say, hey, we have to look at the bottom line. Um, when we introduce sustainable practices or when we, you know, do something, um, you know, that's in the sustainability domain, um, what does it mean for our bottom line? Mm -hmm. And also, what does it mean for our brand image? So, um, there are definitely different industries. I would say right now in Singapore, um, the, the hardware um, companies, for example, is one of the industries yeah. that are, you know, a little bit more um, maybe conscious about the kind of uh, ways that they are generating. Then also, if you look at real estate players, um, facilities management, um, hotels, and so on, that's also another industry that is also 
you know, starting to be a lot more conscious about, for example, the waste that they create. Yeah, and, and, and just to add on that, you mentioned regulation. So, mm -hmm. of course, for specific areas where there is a need to intervene, mm -hmm. I think uh, in, in e-ways, uh, extended producer responsibility frameworks and right? regulations have been put in place really to, to sort of put the onus on the producers uh, to be more mindful of the, the e-ways yeah. that they create. And that's one key area. And the idea, of course, is to extend this to other waste streams. Uh, I think packaging is another uh, a key area, which basically cuts across many different industries and sectors as well, mm -hmm. which the government is trying to, to address. Yeah. Okay. I think at this point, we can bring up the Twitter poll that we had in the lead up to the summit, where we asked the Twitterverse, um, has the pandemic really helped or hurt Asia's move towards transitioning from a linear to a circular economy? Um, and if we could bring the results up, that would be great. But um, what we found was that 81.5% of the Twitterverse actually said it hurt um, the move, whereas 18.5% said it helped. Unsurprising, right? Um, I think at this point, it would be nice to talk about the challenges in terms of doing this transition. So this involves a lot of costs for a company uh, to bear, thinking about the materials they're using for their products, how to recycle it, how to reduce waste. Um, how are they sort of navigating that at this point? Well, maybe I'll, I'll cover it from maybe the consumer's perspective because we do work with a lot of um, young startup founders. So um, at the height of the pandemic, we ran a hackathon where we actually um, invited all of these young participants um, to basically tackle challenges that were of, uh, you know, very big issues to youth in Singapore today. Um, and sustainability was one of the areas. Future of work was one of the areas. And not surprisingly, um, most of them choose to work on future of work. It's, it's almost as though, you know, in the past few years where people were very passionate about sustainability and they want to do more in this space, they put that aside because their most immediate concerns is their bread and butter. Yeah. And I think if you extrapolate that to the corporates, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that the business is secure, it's way more important and making, because they have employees, um, they have um, so much considerations to think about before sustainability, right. that, that that has become something you know, of an afterthought. I think things are changing and we see through our conversations with our partners that um, a lot of these are coming back. Um, there are net zero targets that a lot of companies have set you know, by 2050, by 2030, um, and at the back of, my, of their minds, they do understand that that is something that they have to work towards. Um, but it's true, I do think that, you know, as per the Twitter poll, mm -hmm. it's definitely hurt um, the momentum that we had been on um, prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Well, well I, I think it's both hurt and helped, right? I, I think definitely the COVID and the pandemic um, resulted in, in companies um, taking their eye off that objective and really trying to survive. Uh, and address business cost. Uh, but at the same time, I think during the pandemic, it has also created an awareness on the challenges that we faced in yeah. managing our waste. I think that there was a report that, that was talking about how COVID actually impacted the waste um, sector because there's an increased frequency of waste, there's, yeah. a, there's a shift towards municipal versus industrial waste, etc. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that that's also the period where we see a lot of governments and industries uh, realizing the waste problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that action needs to be taken. And, and basically that creates opportunities for economic uh, opportunities and businesses, right? Um, I, I think the challenges that, that businesses will face um, really depends on whether there are companies that are looking to adopt solutions and to be more sustainable and, and to be more circular uh, and, and different set of challenges that are faced for companies looking to innovate, right? Um, I, I think that, um, for, for the ones that are looking to transit and be more um, be more secure in their practices. They're too used to the linear business model. I think there's a lack of awareness mm -hmm. uh, about circularity and the different business models. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, the other hurdle really is the cost uh, for them to adopt some of right. these solutions. Um, for companies and startups that we work with that are looking to innovate and develop solutions, I think the typical R&D and product development risk uh, remains. Um, but I think there is um, that, that high investment cost that's required and a lot of uncertainty on whether these solutions will actually be adopted in the, in the industry. Right. Yeah. So as an investor, how, how can, well, essentially, how can an investor tap the space right now? And greenwashing is such a big theme. How do they avoid that? Joyce, would you like to go? 
Um, I think the circularity space is one that um, that maybe many investors are still, I think, quite unsure about. Because investors, at the end of the day, they are, they are looking at the ROI for their investments. Um, and sometimes it's hard to uh, sort of look at a, a circularity company and think about what that that multiple could be if they invest in, in, in these companies. We often work with a lot of investors who tell us that they don't quite understand how to do the due diligence around these companies. That's not enough precedence um, in Asia as compared to, let's say, in Europe or US uh, for them to understand um, you know, how to best invest in these companies. Um, at the same time, we do see um, right now with Hyperscale, we're working with a number of impact investors. Um, that we are hoping at the at the end of the accelerator, some of the startups that come out through the accelerator could be potential investments mm -hmm. um, for these investors. And at the same time, we are hoping to create more education for investors to sort of understand how they can be a part of, of uh, sustainability investing. Um, but it takes time to educate. Um, and it takes time for... I, I think there is interest. There's interest from the family offices. There's interest from... Um, you know, the corporate investors, there's interest from the venture capital uh, companies. Uh, it's, it's more about the education that needs to be there for them to understand how to invest in this space. A lot more investors now have, uh, you know, a part dedicated to ESG investing. Um, it could be virtue signaling, but at the same time, it also might mean that they are more passionate and more interested to look at this space, but it will take some time. Uh, from, from Enterprise Singapore's perspective, we are an enterprise development agency, so we, we would engage and support companies in the circular solutions or circular economy regardless of uh, the matrices. Um, but we do have an investment arm, Seeds Capital, that invests in tech startups, uh, including areas uh, within the circular economy and sustainability. Uh, we, we are more a thematic investor rather than a... Uh, impact investor, so we don't really rely on a certain investment matrices. Mm -hmm. um, but we do look at um, opportunities um, areas within water, monitoring and solutions, energy, renewable energy, um, uh, food technologies. And a lot of these areas are also aligned with the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. right, as, as thematics. Um, uh, one point, of, of course, is that we, we do invest alongside private sector venture capitalists, uh, a number of them, and we begin to see more VCs that are more impact focused um, uh, and very focused on sustainability. And each of them have their own matrices. Uh, that they rely on mm -hmm. um, within our ecosystem, investors like um, Trirac, Wavemaker Impact, uh, Emerald Ventures in the area of water. Right. So these are partners that we invest alongside to deploy investments into startups in the space. Okay. Yeah. I think we can take one question at this point. Um, there's one coming in about S and G seeming to play just supporting roles for E. At the end of the day, is it all about the E, or do? Do, do the social and governance side of things um, deserve more attention? Why are we so focused on the environment, essentially? Yeah, well, uh, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll jump on this. No, I, I think eventually we would need to look at all three aspects, mm -hmm. right? Environment, social governance. Um, I think right now, of course, the environmental um, issues are probably a lot more evident and pressing, right? With all the reports on uh, the waste generation, I think um, stats like World Bank's statistics that uh, our global waste is going to increase by 70% by 2050. You know, I, I think all this just creates uh, a focus in this environmental area. And of course, the, the impact on climate change. Um, measurability, I think, is another reason that I'm hearing, right? It's a lot easier to measure and quantify the impact on the environmental space as compared to the social and governance. Um, so perhaps that's why there is an increased focus on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the environmental side. Um, you know, and of course, with green finance uh, picking up steam uh, amongst regulators as well as the financiers. Um, but um, uh, I, I do think that the social and governance, and governance part are just as important. Yeah. Okay. Joyce, if I could come back to... Sorry, would you like to add something to this? Well, I, I think just, just, just to sort of maybe give a little bit of perspective is that is that we all live on one earth yeah. and we all have just one earth to care about. But when it comes to the S, depending on which region of the world you are in, the S is very different. Mm -mm. The S concerns and issues that you have is very different. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier to unite people for that E than the S. I think that's, that's why. Okay, yeah. um, 
I want to come back to the point of multiples. How much are investors willing to pay up for waste technologies at this point? What are the multiples you're seeing in Europe or the US? Um, well, if you look, if you compare Asia versus, um, you know, um, the West, um, I think it's still quite different. A lot more of the capital that um, impact investors are deploying right now are still in the early stage side of things um, because there hasn't been, it is still very nascent um, in Asia. Um, you do have a lot more uh, companies that are investing in, let's say, seed to series A, um, but in, in US uh, and, and in Europe, then you have a lot more growth stage capital that's deploying funds towards circularity companies. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's simply a matter of, of just the fact that we are still in a very nascent stage. 